Good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to Belmont, to those who are our regular members and to anyone visiting with us this morning. We hope that you encounter God during our service this morning. I only have one announcement, and that is to remind elders of our meeting of Kirk Session on Tuesday evening at 7.30 here in the sanctuary. Following the benediction, please resume your seat and you'll be invited to leave. Thanks very much, Chris, for those announcements and grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to see you here today. We continue about the ongoing um, issues that we have with our heat. They're working on that and we hope that within a few weeks or months the heating will be fixed. Meanwhile, wrap up warm, bring a hot water bottle with you if that's necessary or a blanket. But it's great to have you here today. We worship God together and we read uh, Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's what we're here to do, and to sing our praises to our God. And we do so using the words of Psalm 117. together. O oh Lord, it is our privilege to join with all nations to praise your name, to join with the church militant here on earth and the church triumphant in heaven, to join with the angels, and the cherubim and the seraphim, the glorious company of the apostles, the holy fellowship of the prophets, the noble army of the martyrs to praise you. We worship you, Father, of infinite majesty, for you were full of covenant love and mercy towards us, and your faithfulness endures forever. We worship you, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's honourable, true and only Son. When you took it upon yourself to deliver us, you did not abhor the virgin's womb, but you became a man, living a life of sinless perfection and obedience going to the cross as our substitute. And when you overcame the sharpness of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You now sit at the right hand of the Father in glory, and we believe that you shall come to be our judge. And we worship you, Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, our comforter. We confess before your glorious majesty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we have sinned against heaven and earth. Bring us to our senses and have mercy upon us. And may your mercy lighten upon us as our trust is in you and redeem us by Christ's precious blood. Lord, save your people, bless your inheritance, Govern us and lift us up forever. May we magnify the Lord day by day and may we worship your name especially this Lord's day. Keep us this day without sin. Number us amongst your saints in everlasting glory. Lord, we trust in you. Let us never be confounded. 
Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Rachel, I would love you to come and to share some of the things um, about our young people at this time. Thank you. Good morning. I feel a little bit out of practice, so bear with me. <laughs> I wanted to give you a brief update this morning about um, Belmont Youth Ministry and our precious young people. As I have met with young people over the last couple of weeks and asked them to describe their experience of the global pandemic, the resounding answer was to describe it as a roller coaster. I think we've all had those days of extreme highs and extreme lows and everything in between. It has been a time where people have grown in resilience and learnt to trust Jesus in new ways. I'm very proud to report that five of our Young Life leaders have been accepted at Queen's University and have started their inductions this week. Another two leaders have moved to Reading University and Cambridge University. Before the new term began, we provided care packages full of treats, books and information about how to get connected to Christian unions and local churches. Our new youth ministry term looks drastically different compared to this time last year. In line with the PCI guidelines, we are taking a blended approach of meeting face-to-face -face and online. My main focus this month has been to meet with young people one-to-one, -to, -one, to offer support, encouragement, and prayer. I have loved the opportunity to support our young people in this way and have been greatly encouraged by them. On Wednesday evening, Soul Sisters met in Tim Horton's coffee shop. It was filled with a lot of laughter, debates, and asking big questions. We were so thankful to be reunited. As I finish by praying for our young people and families, I would ask that you continue to pray for them throughout this week as they continue to learn how to live and worship God in our new normal. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unending, never failing, and unconditional love for us. We thank you that throughout these past six months you have been with us. In a world that is uncertain, we praise you for being constant and never changing. Lord, we thank you for our young people who are connected with Belmont. We ask that you would sustain them through a new term at school as they navigate change. We thank you for teachers and all support staff in schools. May you strengthen them and give them wisdom and discernment as they inspire, engage and support our young people through their studies. We bring before you all who struggle with mental health. May you bring comfort and keep them safe as they work through this difficult part of their journey. We ask that we thank you for your services in our country that work alongside young people when they are feeling low. We thank you for the NHS CAM service and for the Christians who work in that service. We ask that you would breathe new life and energy into their lives as they support young people. We ask that as we meet this morning that you would bless our young people and their families. Holy Spirit, bring comfort, bring peace, bring hope and bring joy to their lives this week. We pray protection over our young people and ask for continued wisdom as we build relationships and work alongside them. May you use this congregation to bring light and love to our local community during this season of uncertainty. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks very much, Rachel, uh, for leading us there. Let's turn to the New Testament, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and reading verses 11 to 32. Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. Let us hear the word of God. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, the older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he was received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, And I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who was devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate And be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher and your greater glory, our supreme concern, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Do you recognize people behind their masks? It was tricky enough when people hadn't been to the hairdressers or the barbers for a few months, but then whenever the masks came along, um, it was quite complicated recognizing people. There are occasions, though, whenever we don't even recognize ourselves. You know, when you're walking through the center of town and you see your reflection in the shop window? Or if you look at an old photograph of yourself? Or it could be after a prolonged illness or even surgery. You look in the mirror and think, I'm not sure if I recognize myself. Well, today we read from Luke chapter 15. I wonder, did you recognize yourself in that parable? I mean, did you recognize yourself in the person of the younger son or in the person of the older son? And of course, there's a third character in all of this, and Jesus wants us to recognize our heavenly father in the earthly father of this parable. We have this um, picture on the screen It's of um, Rembrandt's famous painting of the return of the prodigal son. And this is what we're hoping to look at this morning, Luke 15, 11 to 32. It was John Calvin in his famous, in the opening sentence of um, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, who famously remarked, our wisdom, in so far as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts the knowledge of God, and of ourselves. Now, we have a major problem 
Um, sin has infected every part of us, including our reasoning, that is, including how we think. And so we tend to think wrongly about God and we think wrongly about ourselves. The late Bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle, thinking about this self-delusion, wrote, the worst ignorance in the world is not to know ourselves. So we need correction, the correction of the Word of God and, of course, the inner teacher of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus told us this parable, so we can understand God correctly and hopefully understand ourselves correctly. Now, I'm very conscious coming to this parable that it is perhaps the best known and even um, most loved of all of Christ's parables. And I think, how can a mediocre preacher in East Belfast improve on that? Somebody said it, it's a bit like trying to gild gold or to paint a lily. Essentially, everything has been said in this parable. Others have reflected on it. For example, Tim Keller in his wonderful book, The Prodigal God, that I would recommend. Nevertheless, I'm going to try to present these timeless truths, hopefully in a timely way, to see if we recognize ourselves. So, the first person in this parable, of course, is the youngest son that we know as the prodigal son. Jesus begins by noting that a father had two sons, verse 11. The eldest son would have been entitled to the lion's share of the property, as it was in Ulster Farms only a generation ago, the younger son, however, also had an entitlement to his share, which he brazenly demanded from his father, verse 12. Now, he really ought to have waited for his father's death before acquiring this. But, he said, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. The impertinent, pertinent youth wanted it all now, but he may as well have said to his father, Dad, I wish you were dead. We don't read how the father felt, but we know from how the story goes on later on that no doubt his heart was broken. And we read simply that he divided his property between his sons, verse 12. The father gave him the freedom to choose. Without delay, the son gathered up all that he had, including the money that he'd received as in his inheritance, and he headed off to a far country where he squandered his property in reckless living, verse 13. So that's why we call him the prodigal son. A prodigal is somebody who's reckless, who's extravagant, who spends everything that he has. But then a double disaster befalls him. He's left with no money, and as a result of famine, he's left with no food. There's an ancient Jewish proverb that says, cursed is the man who would breed swine. In utter desperation, this Jewish lad ends up working for an unclean Gentile feeding pigs, the quintessential unclean animal in Judaism. Hitting rock bottom, he envies their food in the trough. Sitting amongst the filth of the pigs, he finally comes to his senses. Verse 17. He thinks about his father, perhaps the first in a long time. And if you think of it, arising out of the manure with the thought of his father, he heads home, hoping that his father might even take him in as a hired hand. We all know that so well. Jesus originally told the story in response to complaints by Pharisees and scribes who were rather annoyed that Jesus welcomed and even dined with tax collectors and immoral people, some of the most notorious sinners in society at that time. But as I said before, the main point of these three parables in Luke chapter 15 is to illustrate God's delight in sinners making their way home to him rather than that dismissal that was etched on the faces of the religious authorities. A few years ago, when I was at a conference in Scotland, uh, I met a guy by the name of Mez McConnell. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, Mez is the minister of Nidri Community Church in Scotland. He's also the director of 20 Schemes. It's an initiative to revitalize and plant churches in some of Scotland's poorest communities. 
In Scotland, a housing estate is referred to as a scheme. Although Mez is a pastor, you wouldn't think it at first simply by looking at him, and he certainly doesn't have the polish that you'd expect from the man of a cloth. The Mez intrigued me also because he was born in Donegal, not far from where we lived and ministered. Rejected by his mother, he was shifted from pillar to post. He ended up in England where he got involved in violent crime. He was imprisoned and described his teenage years as manic and wild. Then one day, reading the book of Romans, Mez was convicted of his sin. And instead of him looking to blame other people, he realized that he was a sinner desperately in need of rescue. Years later, Mez went on to train for the ministry. I like this little incident. Whenever he was at Bible college, he got into an argument with another student, and he said to him, I'll punch your face in, mate. Looking back, he says, I guess the guys weren't ready for that kind of discourse. Mez, like the prodigal son, was in a far-off country, squandering his life in reckless living. And there, at his lowest point, he came to his senses and he made his way home to God through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And the Heavenly Father welcomed him. There was a very famous German Lutheran theologian and preacher a generation ago by the name of Helmut Theolike. And he recalls how once he placed a mirror in front of his infant son. You've maybe done this yourselves with your children. At first, the little baby enjoyed the image. And then he writes, all of a sudden, the expression on his little face changed when he began to recognize the similarity of the motions. And he seemed to be saying, that's me. And so says Theolike, That should happen to us whenever we read this parable. Initially, when we read this parable, we can think about the wild son who thankfully comes to his senses and comes home. And then we can think about other prodigals that we know, maybe members of the family, friends, neighbors, people with colorful backgrounds like Mez McConnell. But then as we look at it and with the Holy Spirit speaking into our hearts, we begin to actually say, that's me. Because the prodigal son is actually a picture of every one of us. Every single person born since Adam, with the exception of Jesus Christ. And however respectable we may appear on the outside, the scripture says again and again that we've all left the Heavenly Father. We've all chartered our own way in life. None of us actually want to remain at home, and we certainly don't want to submit to God's Word. We know better after all. And yet the further we are from home, the hungrier we feel inside. But often the Lord speaks to us when we're at our lowest, It's perhaps whenever all of the certainties of life have been taken from us. And maybe COVID has done this for some people. We come to our senses and we realize, like the prodigal, that we have sinned against heaven and that we need to make our way home to God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, that's how and where the Christian life begins. Making our way home to God through his son, Jesus Christ, and in his grace, him welcoming us and forgiving us. And yet this journey home actually characterizes the whole of the Christian life. Because even those who do know and love the Lord end up wandering from him. And so we need to regularly make our journey home. I hope you can recognize yourself. The second character in this parable we all know is the father. Tim Keller calls the father a prodigal. Isn't that a bit unusual? 
That is, the Father is also outrageous and extravagant with what he has, but positively so. He's waiting for his son, and he sees him approaching, and he does what no man in the ancient Near East would have done, certainly no respectable man. That is, he pulled up his robes and he ran. Full of compassion, he threw his arms around his son, and he wept with joy. He cut short his son's confession and without delay organizes a homecoming celebration, verse 21. And so no expense is spared. He's a prodigal father. He brings in the best robe, ring, shoes, and he slaughters the prize calf. The father then announces in verse 23, Let's eat and let's celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. I don't need to spell it out to you, do I? Who the Father in this parable represents in the spiritual realm. You know, if we begin to accept the treacherous nature of our sin, then we're very well placed to understand the extravagance, the lavishness, the unrestrained nature of God's grace towards those who repent and come home through Jesus Christ. In fact, to make our homecoming possible, God holds back nothing. He gives his only begotten son to death on the cross so that we could be welcomed home as sons and daughters. This, my friends, is grace. And some people have said grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's how much he loves us. So the wonderful news is, whatever you've done, however far you've strayed, whatever skeletons you might have hanging in your closet, God assures you of his fullest welcome. When you come to your senses and make your way home to him through his son, Jesus Christ. The church father, Ambrose, put it beautifully. This picture of Christ welcoming us, he says, Christ falls on your neck to free your neck from the yoke of slavery and to hang his sweet yoke upon your shoulders. Isn't that beautiful? Almost done. The parable probably should have ended at verse 24. But there's another character that we need to consider in this, and that's the elder brother. We might have expected the return of the youngest son to be met with jubilation by all in the household, but this is not the case. The eldest brother returns from the fields, and in a fit of jealousy, he refuses to come into the celebration, verse 28. On hearing this, his father goes out and pleads with him to come in. But in bitterness, he protests that he has slaved at home for years, yet he had not so much as received a goat to celebrate with his friends, that is, to slaughter and to have a feast. He caustically refers to his own brother as this son of yours. And yet we look at the father. With ongoing tenderness, the father reminds him that his brother has in no way diminished his place in the family. Instead, he should join in the festivities, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Jesus, of course, is addressing the complaints of the Pharisees. I wonder, though, do we recognize ourselves in this? Very interesting, the conversations that I have had over the years in, in people's homes. It's funny, over the years, a recurring conversation has occurred, and that is some very respectable church members look with skepticism at people who've had dramatic conversions. <laughs> we'll see how long that takes. I've also met people who sometimes are worried about their children or grandchildren because they maybe attend another church or taking this religion thing a bit too seriously. Can you ever take the creator of the universe too seriously? 
We need to watch ourselves because as Leon Morris, the scholar, said, those who reject repentant sinners are out of line with the Father's will. And such a posture of hardness may well indicate that that person is lost and has not yet experienced God's grace. You see, it's possible to be lost in reckless living, and it's also possible to be lost in religious living. God extends his grace to the lost, whoever we are, and he says, come home. Amen. We'll bow our heads together in prayer. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed in Calvary. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed in Calvary. Though coming weak and vile, thou dost my strength assure Thou dost my vileness fully cleanse till spotless all and pure. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. This Jesus calls me on to perfect faith and love, to perfect hope and peace and trust for earth and heaven above. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Our thoughts now turn uh, to pray for others. Father, we thank you for your compassion your grace, and for your care. We pray that in your fatherly love, you would consider the concerns of your church, and in particular, the needs of all those who are in distress at this time. We pray for those who are ill and lonely, bereaved, struggling with broken relationships or difficulties. Out of your mercy, graciously supply them with all the necessities of body and soul. We pray that you would grant grace and steadfastness to all those who are intimidated and oppressed for the sake of your word, particularly in the Middle East, in parts of Africa and Asia. May they remain firm and steadfast in their profession of you until the end. And we pray to you for all of our rulers and those in authority. We pray for an honourable government at Westminster and Stormont. Pray especially for our leaders at this difficult time. May you direct and guide them according to your will so that we together may lead a God-fearing, peaceful, and Christian life, and after this life, possess eternal life through Christ. We pray for the NHS, those who are in the hospitality and tourism industries, those who have businesses, and those who are involved in education. And in a moment of silence, we bring to our Father the needs of those we know best. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We sing in closing um, 500, God of Grace, Amazing Wonder. So may that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.